I am very pleased to welcome Katya Kulinicheva to the Future Flying Forum. And Katya is the group CFO for Zero Avia, and a company that anyone interested in the future of flying will have heard out of, if not throughout the last few years, then at least throughout the last couple of months. Um, and just in case it had passed you by, Zero Avia is focused on hydrogen electric solutions, um, targeting first a 1919 seat aircraft for a 500 mile range, but uh, also looking to um, planning for integration into regional jets by the end of the decade or before the end of the decade, actually. And Katya herself has a BA in politics, philosophy and economics from Oxford University, as well as an MBA from INSEAD. And the prior to joining Sea Arabia for the past three years, Katya was with leading sustainability investment firm Systemic and oversaw the firm's first six investments, including of Zeravia, actually. Um, so I thought we'd begin with, there's been some amazing and interesting news coming out of Zeravia recently. We have the, the agreement with Mitsubishi for applications of regional jets. We have the partnership with Alaska Airlines, looking into increasing the powertrain to be able to power Q400s um, for their regional traffic as well. Oh. And we also have the, the very exciting uh, agreement with Rotterdam, the Hague Airport, for bringing commercial hydrogen flight as soon as 2024 between the UK and the Netherlands. And so I thought maybe you would like to tell me and our viewers a little bit in your own words about what has been going on recently, what of these developments are you most excited about, and also how does this fit into Zero Avia's overall strategy? Moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So maybe I'll just say a few kind of cross-cutting remarks about uh, that kind of bring us to those announcements. And there will also be a few more coming out next week. So stay tuned for those. But I, you know, I won't, oh, exciting. <laughs> won't go into too much detail, but we're not done yet. <laughs> so um, no, but just to say, I guess, you know, from the beginning when we were set up four years ago, we've always taken an ecosystem approach to, to what we're trying to do. So I think we've always recognized that what we're doing is difficult, that we can't do it alone. Um, and that the piece, you know, that the, the piece we want to play, which is this kind of enabling propulsion piece of the puzzle, it does require close collaboration with other value chain participants, from the airports to the hydrogen fuel providers to the airframes, and then of course to the end operators of these aircraft, the airlines. So I would say that you know the set of announcements that came out last week is really exemplifying that approach, and it's you know just a, it, it it's a, a good sort of outcome of all the hard work that we've put put in for the last six months. But it's not sort of a new way of doing what we do. It's really just sort of public output of all that work that's gone in really over the last four years. So that overall approach, coordinating everyone together, working with the value chain and playing that enabling role is something that we think is the best way forward. And that's really important to how we do our work. Um, so that's just a bit about kind of our overall, I guess, business development approach that is very partnership and ecosystem based. Another sort of a cross cutting comment is that while even when we were set up, we always had ambitions to move to the whole uh, sector, to airframes of all sizes, flying long ranges, cross Atlantic, all of that. In the in our earlier days, I think we ourselves were a little bit more uh, sort of cautious and careful about what timelines might actually be realistic for the larger aircraft, the longer ranges. So in the earlier days of Zero Avia, we ourselves focused our efforts and our narrative a lot more on that first segment, the 20 seat aircraft, which is what we're working on right now and what we're uh, bringing to market first. But I would say that in the years that we've been operating, first of all, our own level of confidence has increased greatly through the work that we've already done and the testing we've been able to do. But there's also been really exciting industry momentum commitments from players, large and small, both to just kind of net zero and you know the overall kind of cleaning up the aviation sector, but also commitments specifically to hydrogen and hydrogen electric that have been popping up around um, kind of large and small players. So I think it, that has um, caused us to be that much more ambitious um, and to work simultaneously on a number of different product categories. So as a result, we're working, we have basically two product families. ZA600 is a 600 kilowatt system, which is effectively a PT6 replacement for aircraft, you know, nine to nine to 20 seats in size. And that continues to be our focus. That will be our first market introduction, but we're now spending a lot of energy also on that next product family uh, that will be targeting sort of the bread and butter of regional aviation, those sort of larger turboprop aircraft, as well as regional jets. So those are just a few kind of themes, I think that brought us to those uh, recent announcements and also just 
kind of uh, I think summarize some of the fine tunings and strategy that we have done um, as you know as our own sort of uh, approach has matured. Thank you so much for that overview. And it does seem the timeline does seem to crystallize as we move along. And of course, this is just the, the, the announcements are just the culmination of everything that's been going on behind the scenes. So it must be have been really exciting projects to be working on and to see them come to well fruition um, within just a few within just a few years in time span. That's amazing. Um, I guess you have you cannot tell me anything about who might be operating that first 2024 flight between the UK and the Netherlands. Still working on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but we're actually, we're trying to bring together there both the hydrogen refueling side um, and the operator side. So hopefully we'll have both of those locked in over the next month or so um, oh. and we'll be able to announce that. But yes, yeah, still working on that. Right. And actually just, you know, final comment I realized that I didn't make is that, you know, I think the, the, the these partnerships that we've finally been able to announce, I think are also really testament to the team we've been able to build in particular over the last year. So I joined about two years ago at that point, we were about 11 people. Uh, a year ago, we were still about 20. Today, oh. we are, I think, are 80 plus. Um, and we actually have staffed, like, you know, a real professional business development team with backgrounds from Rolls Royce and other, you know, yeah. large OEMs who have done this for a long time. And I think that's really been, allowed us to accelerate um, sort of our external efforts as well as our internal engineering efforts. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. I can imagine it must be a lot of dynamic energy with everyone coming in like that as well. Um, adding to the passion that that the original team has brought with them. Um, I'll get back to that a little bit in a second, but um, first you spoke about um, refueling, for example, and that's one of the issues obviously often raised with hydrogen powered flight. Um, what about regulatory frameworks? What kind of regulatory hurdles do you foresee? Um, and how are you working with um, authorities to overcome that in any way? Yeah, absolutely. So in general, aviation is heavy, heavily regulated, right? So even if you're not introducing a new fuel type and a new type of technology, I mean, if you're just bringing a new engine to market, there's a timeline for getting that certified. So yeah. that's just what we're up against. And it's there for good reason. But it's definitely it adds that additional layer of complexity to this industry versus, you know, automotive and maybe some others uh, where innovation has been active recently. So in our case, the approach we've taken is and it's actually part of the reason that we work on specifically the propulsion and try to minimize changes to the airframe itself, yeah. because we want to minimize what we need to get recertified in order to come to market. So our approach is that we need to get a type certificate for our propulsion system and an, a supplemental type certificate for the airframe, which means that effectively we're not making any structural changes to the airframe. We're not fundamentally altering its kind of uh, flight properties, but we are kind of offering an alternative propulsion technology for that airframe. Um, so that's kind of, those are the two um, pieces that we need in order to be able to actually sell our product into any particular airframe. Um, so that's sort of what our plan is for the next couple of years is to get that done. So we'll start with one launch airframe within each product category and then add on additional airframes as we go along. And we've done a lot of work to identify what the most logical airframes are to target with the new segment based on production volumes and all that sort of stuff. So that's just kind of what we need in terms of the challenges that we're up against and how we're solving them. So you know, no a hydrogen electric system has never been certified before. And so there isn't kind of a playbook. We don't have sort of a set of steps that we know we have to go through and take them off. We are kind of co-developing that together with the regulatory authorities. So for that reason, we've engaged them very closely pretty much from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so in our case, we're working closely with FAA and CAA just based on where we are currently located. Um, so FA, you know, US is where we started. So FA, um, we, we've engaged pretty much, pretty much from day one. CAA, we engaged about a year and a half ago when we started um, our first series of flight tests in the UK. Um, and CAA generally is much more stringent, even at the experimental stage. So we've had to have real close engagement for every test flight, every sort of interim prototype of our system that we've developed. They've been sort of fully on board with. Okay. So I guess it's close collaboration, close engagement, trying to write that playbook together trying to come up with as efficient, but of course, thorough approach as possible uh, to getting this done um, and agreeing uh, those kind of conditions to certification as early as possible so that we understand the timeline that we need to follow. And I think the other complexity is that um, sort of there, there are a number of separate agencies. So there's CIA, there's YAS, obviously there's FAA. Um, they do have various bilateral agreements, but in part because of Brexit, there's a bit of complexity there. Um, so there's some new agreement mm -hmm. being written now in terms of how exactly CAA and EASA work together. Um, and be, again, because it's a new technology, we don't yet know for certain once we've got the CAA approval, how do we translate it to FAA and others? 
Um, so that's another area that we, again, are exploring very proactively to make sure that our you know, addressable market is maximized from the beginning. So we're not limited to one single geography. So, okay. yeah. Well, let's hope that the process runs smoothly and that they can all find a way to cooperate despite the, yeah. despite the, the minor restructuring of, of uh, events. Um, so you talked about um, perhaps or you talked about for now, the airframes will stay the same. But I know you've also mentioned that you are thinking about in the future about how could this, how this technology will go into a, a differently designed aircraft that will be specifically designed to accommodate this kind of propulsion technology. How far in the future do you foresee that happening? And what kind of design are you thinking about? Would it be something like the um, blended wing concept from Airbus that we've seen, for example, or what type of ideas have been talked about there? Yeah, well, so I guess I'd say a couple of over general remarks. I guess first of all is that you know if if we if we could start from a blank slate, we would of course design even the airframes we're working with now differently. Yeah. They're not they're generally quite old. In particular, in the region aviation segment, not a whole lot of innovation has taken place. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the airframes, first of all, you know that that are out there are sort of 20, 30 years plus in age, and the models themselves have not benefited from the innovation that's happened, for example, in the narrow body segment just because that segment has not grown as quickly, it's not as lucrative, and so not as much money has gone into those airframes in general. So that's just to say that kind of the airframes we're working with are not as modern as, for example, an airbody and beyond. Um, so if we could and had, you know, had a crystal ball and if we had all the time and, and money in the world and we could have the best airframe to work with, it would look quite different. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as Zeravia, our approach has always been to be as practical and sort of near term as possible and for that reason we want to just take the airframes as they are get a propulsion system in there get them flying and then modify the airframe over time once we've validated the case for our propulsion technology so that's just generally kind of how we think about it we we're not airframe engineering experts that's not kind of the team that we have assembled so for that reason that that is why we are uh, striking partnerships like mitsubishi and hopefully there'll be a few others that we announce in due course where we want to work with the airframe design experts First of all, in integrating our technology to the existing airframes, but then on jointly figuring out how to continue those improvements longer term. So what we won't be doing all that work in house, we will doing, be doing it in close collaboration with airframe manufacturers, but absolutely we see improvements. I mean, th they could come in all the segments we are addressing, but they would be particularly important for the larger aircraft, uh, you know, where sort of weight and volume start to become constraints as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess in terms of the you know the types of, of changes we're looking at, uh, one is just kind of lightweighting the system. So mm -hmm. weight is the most important yeah. importance. You know, our system also comes with some weight considerations, even though hydrogen is a light molecule. You have the tanks, you've got the fuel cell itself. So there, there's some we could definitely use additional weight if we had it. Um, so there's just looking at new materials um, and otherwise optimizing the, optimizing the system to to, to weigh less. Uh, there's distributed propulsion. So because our system is electric, uh, we no longer need it to be located kind of centrally in the way that current systems are. So we're able to have multiple props. We're able to distribute kind of the propulsion uh, sort of nu nuclei across uh, the airframe rather than having them in the single place. So those are kind of some immediate innovations, but I'm sure that there'll be many more once we you know, start to do the design work in, in more detail. At the moment, most of the design work has focused on the 20 and that kind of 50 to 70 seat mm -hmm. uh, aircraft where we don't want to make changes to begin with. So we're basically saying, here's the airframe, kind of how can we work with it without losing any passenger seats, without work, losing any cargo. Um, but phase two will definitely be kind of how can we create more space? How can we optimize it to, to, to sort of really fit this technology? In either case, it's a, it's a wonderful marriage of, of older and trusted technology and then the future coming in and then, then that evolving yeah. into something. Yeah, and I think we, you know, we tried to draw parallels of just kind of how this has happened historically. So like when mm -hmm. the jet engine was introduced, initially it worked with air, old airframes kind of as they were designed for, for prior, you know, for turboprop and, and uh, technologies in particular. And then once the jet engine was introduced and people understood how it worked and understood its advantages, then we started Kind of accommodating airframe design around that um, and I, we expect the same to happen in this area um, where you know so we think the, the the real bottleneck is propulsion so we we want to develop that first um, yeah. and then um, yeah, optimize the airframe around that that's a really oh. interesting parallel there with the jet engine actually um well another 
issue apart from uh, apart from um, the refueling is of course the accessibility to clean hydrogen. And I know you formed a partnership with Octopus Hydrogen for, for the supply of green hydrogen coming up. And I know Saudi Arabia is also anticipating over a demand for over 100,000 uh, power units within 10 years. How do you think green, green hydrogen needs to scale up to be able to meet that demand? And what kind of investments are we seeing into green hydrogen today to make that happen? You know, we, we absolutely recognize that this is going to be a barrier to adoption in the same way that it's happened with, with uh, you know, battery electric vehicles. Um, the single biggest probably reason that people are not buying them as actively, right, is the, the charging sort of coverage. We think in general in aviation, the challenge is a little bit simpler because you have much more concentrated pockets of demand. So you have like a, a, a relatively small number of airports that cover a very high percentage of flights. So just solving that challenge is, is a little bit easier and you get to economies of scale faster. And also, I mean, while of course there are flights that are not scheduled far in advance, the majority of commercial aviation is scheduled. You know where that aircraft is gonna go that day, you know kind of how much it's carrying and where it, has, it can refuel and things like that. So it's again, a little bit easier uh, to solve that optimization challenge that it is in ground mobility. So that's just, that's part of the reason actually we think that hydrogen is such a good fit for aviation and that the infrastructure challenge is a bit simpler. Um, but that being said, you know, still, even, even at a large airport, it, is, it still takes work to, to get green hydrogen there at a price that makes sense for operators. So as Zeravia, we're doing a few things about it. It's one is that we're offering, um, so we're going to be selling our powertrain to airlines on a kind of power by the hour basis that will include maintenance and fuel. So we recognize that a new fuel is a risk to the airline, and we want to take that risk away from them by saying we'll, you know, we'll, we'll guarantee it to you at the right time, at the right price. You just pay us a single, single dollar per hour figure, and we'll do the rest. Mm -hmm. We're doing that for two reasons. One is to sort of re remove the risk for them, as I mentioned, but also because we think that we actually have we're quite well positioned to consolidate that demand because we'll be working with multiple operators and we'll have greater visibility on sort of how those demand flows will look. Um, and it, we are better positioned, at least in the early days when this technology is so new, uh, to kind of consolidate that offtake and work with the providers of hydrogen um, to, you know, to optimize cost ultimately. Um, so that's kind of one piece. Second piece is that I think in particular in the first few rollouts, possibly beyond, we acknowledge that we will play a pretty active role in the infrastructure. So we're not just going to sort of sit and wait for someone to put it in to the, to the, to the airport. We indeed already have partnered with Octopus. Shell is also one of our investors and we are, you know, we're developing a commercial partnership with them as we speak uh, to help us solve, to, to help us kind of pre-solve that challenge now. And that there we're looking both at the production, sort of where is it going to be produced? Is it going to be on site, near site? Uh, are we going to be building like a hydrogen refueling hub that also works for buses, trucks, et cetera? Are we looking at central production somewhere far away and it's going to get trucked in or even pipelined in? So all of those are valid modes and all of them come with you know, pros and cons. And so we're evaluating all of those kind of um, you know, types of, of production. Um, and then the other piece that maybe sometimes a little bit underlooked is the actual refueling like the, the truck itself and how it handles gas at different you know, pressurized, pressurization levels and uh, the exact refueling technology um, that also needs some innovation because today we don't refuel aircraft with gas. Uh, so it's something that we're also working with the likes of Shell on um, because they have a lot of expertise. Um, they're one of the largest providers of Jet A uh, to, to airlines today. Um, so it's something also that there's there to be solved. So there's the production, the refueling, and then I guess ultimately bringing it actually all to the airport which again is where the airport partnerships come in because we have to understand the permitting, uh, planning permissions, their own economics because airlines make a lot of money on fuel. So we want to make sure that we haven't cut them out as well. So it's really understanding again, that kind of web um, and, and the role that, we, the enabling role that we can play within that. So. And specifically in terms of green hydrogen production, how are you seeing the timeline for, for investment into green hydrogen? Well, so we think it's um, when I think in our modeling, once it's above uh, six flights per day, um, even in smaller aircraft, the economics of that electrolysis kind of okay. installation are very attractive. So we think it's a profitable business model uh, yeah. for you know whoever really wants to be you know project developing, owning and operating those assets. It can be an electrolysis player themselves. It can be a project developer, and more and more of those are popping up. It could be somebody like Shell that decides to kind of own the production assets as well. So there's a few stakeholders that might end up actually financing that infrastructure. But we think the economic case is there. 
Yep. We think it's our job to demonstrate that the demand will be there, right? So that's what we're focusing on now. We're signing up customers. We're working on route studies with them to, to arrive at those kind of launch hotspot areas. So say, I don't know, California and Scotland might be our two launch locations. So we'll be building a case there. Of it's these three airports. This is the demand. This is the timeline. And, you know, we're really working at bottom up like that. But, you know, our timeline to introduce this to the market is 2024. Uh, so for, for our first few launch airports, that's the timeline for the hydrogen infrastructure as well. Um, it, it will take time, you know, to have full global coverage. Uh, but we, we kind of think that if you prove the economics, then the money will flow. Um, so that's that's very much what our current focus is. Um, yeah, and we do intend to use only green hydrogen because, you know, our, our mission is to be zero emission. So it's um, green hydrogen really, while technologically we could use any hydrogen, it's very important for us that it's green because that's ultimately what we're offering to airlines, so. Amazing, uh, thank you. Um, what, yes, the incredible infrastructure that needs to happen for, for global supply, but somebody has to be the first mover, right? And somebody has to be the initiator, so. Yeah, and I think so, I'm actually just speaking to somebody yesterday um, about this, that it, I think people really underestimate um, how complex this would also be for battery electrics. I think a lot of people think that hydrogen has this huge incremental infrastructure spend versus battery electric, you can just plug it into the wall and sort of off you go. That's not the case. So if you were, you know, even if battery electric technology were to be able to fly aircraft of 20 plus seats a decent range and battery technology were to improve sufficiently to do that, the charging infrastructure would still be a hurdle because the, the reality is that a lot of these airports just don't have the kind of the, um, the, the the cables drawn to them to be able to refuel at, at sufficient speed and, and the actual refueling infrastructure itself doesn't exist. As we know for cars, we've had yeah. to work a lot on being able to recharge them a certain time. As frame for aviation, that challenge is much more significant. It, you know, if it takes you three hours to refuel an aircraft, it kind of kills the economics completely for the airline. Yeah. So while, I mean, okay. arguably it's a bit easier to get electricity somewhere than it is to get hydrogen, in some locations, that's actually not the case. It's easier mm -hmm. to truck something in than it is to lay cables. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, I think that that actual exact refueling kind of piece itself is equally challenging for traditional electric as it is for hydrogen. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that for that comparison and that insight as well. Um, in terms of challenges, I know you serve as a mentor for entrepreneurs and what do you see as the main challenges for people starting businesses in clean tech today? And how has that shifted over the past few years? I think maybe I'll start with how it's shifted. I think it's 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 gotten a lot easier in the last few years. It's still not easy, but I think, you know, where maybe when I got into the space, which was about sort of seven years ago, uh, we were kind of just starting this sort of like clean tech 2.0 wave. Um, you know, I think there was, a, you know, with, with the, the Paris Agreement, there was some renewed energy to some of these areas. I think people were starting to rethink what is that next wave of infrastructure investments? What are some of these enabling software and other innovations and how do we finance them? And there started being a greater push on ESG and sort of, you know, the SDGs and all of these kind of themes that allowed more money and generally more interest to be uh, devoted here. So I, I do feel that it's, I think a few years ago, people were worried that, oh, maybe SG, SDG, all this is kind of a fad and, you know, next year will be blockchain and next year will be something else. I don't think that's happening. I think there's been a shift, you know, in how people, people I think are really internalizing the cost of our activity to the planet in their business cases, whatever they might be, and realizing that we do need to invest in alternative ways of consuming, producing, traveling, all of that to kind of have a planet to live on. Um, so I think that recognition is much more mainstream, which just means that, you know, as a startup, it means when you go to an investor, it doesn't take you as long to educate them on what you're actually doing and why. Um, so I think the first half of that page, you can kind of skip through it and actually get to the meat of it in a way that was not the case yeah. uh, three or four years ago. Um, so there's a greater level of awareness, greater level of commitment, greater level of understanding of some of the sectors. But I think the flip side is that a lot of certainly mainstream investors don't really understand the sectors very deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and so while maybe they get the overall theme, unless you're doing something pretty simple, some software kind of tool type of thing, if you're working on hardware or if you're working on more kind of deep tech based innovation, the reality is that unless they are a specialized investor that looks at that specific sector, a lot of the more generalist investors, even climate ones, don't often have sufficient industry expertise to kind of really, really understand what you're doing 
um, and be able to kind of assess the risks of it appropriately. So I would say that, you know, that I think is still a, a, a cha an outstanding challenge in that a lot of people have kind of jumped on the bandwagon, but not necessarily done the work to really understand what's going on in those sectors. Um, I mean, financing has gotten a lot easier, but it's still a challenge. I think the seed series A is now very well established as like, I think it's pretty, not, okay, not easy, but it's much easier than it was to get that funding. Um, but I think that kind of series B territory is still a little challenging, especially if you are in the um, kind of pre-revenue, deep tech, longer lead time kind of environment. Um, I think I think investors find it harder to understand what should a company have at that stage for us to finance them. Because in the traditional world, you know, you'd expect solid revenue generation at that point, and you should be kind of accelerating and entering new markets and all of that. But when when you are in you know space like ours or another kind of deep deep tech type of innovation, it is harder for an investor to to assess risk and, and to kind of and to kind of appropriately determine what risk they should and should not be taking with that company at that stage. So I think that stage is still a little bit difficult. Mm. Um, but, but you know, but it is also there's more players popping up and it's getting more mature. And hopefully it will resolve itself as as uh, credit risk uh, advisors also become more familiar with um, <clears throat> with this type of responsible investment and investing yeah. into clean tech, etc. Yeah. Um, okay, we are coming to time. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share about what's coming up for Saravia in the next foreseeable future? I mean, we've we've talked about so much, <clears throat> and so but if there's anything you'd like to add that we didn't touch upon. Yeah, I mean, I guess we'll just uh, sort of a shameless plug, stay tuned for some more announcements coming up from us in the next couple of weeks. So I said the next big milestone for, for us will be the first flight um, in our 20 seat uh, aircraft system. Um, so that should happen at some point over the next two, three months. So um, also watch out for that, um, because that will be that will be the first flight of our commercial system. So it's a really big milestone for us. Um, and we think it will significantly de-risk sort of the remaining product development timeline. So. Yeah, so we'll be busy at work doing doing that, and yeah, stay tuned for more announcements for us. Yeah, I can imagine it's a big milestone not just for you, but for aviation in general. And I personally am very excited to to follow the announcements closely, and everyone at Simple Flying is. And we would like to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and to our readers and viewers. And yeah, wish you the best of luck. Absolutely, thanks for having me.